Well, welcome back to our class on the Proverbs, the Words of Wisdom as we've titled it. Um, we had a problem with our audio recording uh, in our live class on Sunday morning, and so this is not a live class that I'm teaching today, uh, but I'm still going to go over the same material, and so I thank you for tuning in and being a part of this class. Let me pray for us and we'll get started. Our gracious God in heaven, we do thank you for the blessing of your word. And we thank you that it is true, that it is the foundation upon which we may live and move and have our being in Christ. And we thank you for this class. We ask today that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct us. We pray that you would teach us, encourage us, and edify us as your children. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we begin our study uh, on the topical study on adultery and self-control, you may remember from our last class that I actually started with self-control. And we walked through a number of the Proverbs uh, in looking at what is self-control, what does self-control encompass. You may recall that Proverbs 25, 28 says, A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Uh, and in looking at what all does self-control encompass, um, last week we saw that it encompasses temper and anger. It encompasses strife and quarreling. It encompasses words. Uh, that is, too many words, venting, uh, or just simply a lack of restraint with our words. And then we saw that it encompasses self-exaltation. But where we left off last week, and the, the fifth point of what do the proverb, or, or how is self-control defined, and what all does that encompass in the Proverbs, the fifth point that we landed on last week was sexual temptation. And so that's where I want to turn today, and I want to turn with the topic of adultery. Or I want to expand that to adultery and sexual immorality. Now, if you're a student of the Proverbs, you know that primarily when sexual temptation is referred to within the Proverbs, and I'm talking about just in terms of, of total number of Proverbs, uh, it is typically referring to adultery in that Hebrew word defined as adultery. But, but let's start here and let me ask you, what is adultery? How would you define adultery? Well, in a very narrow sense, I would define it in looking at how it is uh, portrayed and uh, described within Scripture. I would say that adultery is the sexual breaking of the marital covenant between a man and a woman. And so, if we were to expand beyond that, if that is adultery, then what is sexual immorality? Well, sexual immorality, simply put, uh, we could say that it is anything outside of, any sexual activity outside of, in including uh, sexual activity of the mind, such as lust, outside of the bounds of marriage, of biblical marriage. And so I think that as we come and look at Proverbs that address adultery, so also we may include sexual immorality in general there, acts both uh, of the body and of the mind, because they're related. Sexual immorality is any sexual activity outside of the bounds of marriage. Adultery is a sexual breaking of the marital covenant. And, and so they're, they're related in terms of the sinful activity. And so as we look through these, I want you to, to keep in mind, and I want us to dive in today in one of the key Proverbs within the total book of Proverbs, and that's chapter 5. And if you have a Bible with you, I'd like to ask you to turn to the fifth chapter, the fifth chapter of Proverbs, and let's look at this together. I'm going to read the entire chapter for you, and perhaps you'll follow along. Uh, it would be helpful for you to have a Bible with you, because I'm going to be referring back and forth to certain specific Proverbs within this fifth chapter. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding, that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. 
but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps follow the path of Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life, her ways wander, and she does not know it. And now, O sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others, and your years to the merciless, lest strangers take their fill of your strength, and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life you groan, when your flesh and body are consumed, and you say, How I hated discipline, and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembly, in the assembled congregation. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing waters from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of knowledge, or rather, he dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. All right, so that's the, the fifth chapter, and if we were to uh, summarize, if, if I was to say, how would you summarize that uh, fifth chapter in one sentence? Uh, I think that a good summary is the folly of sexual immorality and the blessing of marital fidelity. And keep in mind, when I'm talking about marital fidelity, I'm talking about those who are married, a man and a woman, in a covenant marriage before God, but I'm also referring to those who are not yet married, but they possibly could be married, and so uh, they would be faithful to that which is theoretical, theoretically to come. Um, of course, there are those among us who uh, do not marry, uh, either by, by choice or whatever the case is, uh, but that still pertains. Uh, we're supposed to be uh, sexually faithful to the Lord, specific to Proverbs chapter 5. Again, I think a good summary is the folly of sexual immorality and blessing of marital fidelity. So, looking at chapter 5, then, let's pull out a few things themes that I think are helpful in this study. And, and the first question I want to ask is, is what are the proverbial characteristics of sexual temptation? What are the proverbial characteristics of sexual temptation? Look with me at verse 3. Verse 3 refers to the lips of a forbidden woman. The lips of a forbidden woman woman. And so one of the characteristics is that which is forbidden. Uh, again, that which is forbidden in, in terms of, of sexual immorality is anything sexually, both of, of body and of mind, that is outside of the bounds of covenant marriage between one man and, and one woman. Secondly, in verse 3 again, the lips drip honey smoother than oil. I'm just pulling a few things out there. Uh, and the idea here is what I'm wanting you to focus on is this imagery. And, and again, I, understand, I know that you, you know this, but, but keep in mind, there's not literally honey dri dripping from uh, this woman who we don't know who she is uh, from, from her lips. It, it's imagery, isn't it? And, and smoother than, than oil. Once again, it's, it's imagery there. And the, the idea is, is that a characteristic of sexual temptation is that which is sensual that which is sensual. And again, it's not that that which is sensual all, that which is sensual 
is not sinful always uh, because we see later in chapter 5 that, that Solomon encourages uh, this young man that he's writing to, uh, to encourages him to uh, find delight, to find satisfaction in the wife of his youth as, he's refer as she's referred to there. Um, and so there is a, a sensuality that can be appreciated and enjoyed, but it is within the bounds of marriage, not outside of it, that which is forbidden, that which is sensual, sensual of someone else. And I gave the example Sunday that I find uh, uh, so interesting as I, I was driving down Interstate 40 uh, several weeks ago and there was a, a billboard advertising a gentleman's club, uh, which as we know, no gentlemen go to. Um, and so it was advertising and the advertisement had a woman's lips, um, which I, I found confusing. I thought, well, that's ridiculous. Why, why would you, you do that? They're, they're wanting to grab, I, I guess, a man's attention, come to this so-called gentleman's club, whatever the case is. But immediately I thought about that which is sensual. Solomon and writing and is painting this picture, this imagery and lips and dripping honey and smoother than oil. All of this is to paint this sensuous picture. Thirdly, Look at, uh, well, actually, you can't look there. Well, if you have a Bible in front of you, you can turn over to uh, chapter 6, verse 25. I'm getting outside the bounds a little bit here of um, chapter 5. But in, in chapter uh, 6, it says, Do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. So another characteristic of, of sexual temptation is outward beauty. Outward beauty. And, and again, the, the idea here is that um, that's what this young man is focused on. And again, it, this could be across the, the board, a, a, a woman to, to a man, or even what we're dealing with uh, in, in the case of same-sex attraction. Uh, this is, of course, ageless as well. Young applies to young and old. But, but the idea is that, that you are focused on the outward. Um, today we would we would refer to this as objectification um, when a when a, a, a man or a woman I suppose is is viewing pornography for example um, there is a, a, a sense of objectification they they are seeing that woman only as the object of their desire um, they don't care about that woman or I, I suppose a man um, about their soul about who they are as a person, about their value of a, as, as a human being. Uh, no, none of that is considered. Rather, it's just a fixation on the outward beauty, not the inward person. And uh, again, all of these are tied together. It's that which is forbidden. It's that which is drawing out this uh, sensuous description. For example, also in Proverbs 6.25, it says, Do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. Which, which is a, a, a beautiful poetic expression. I mean, obviously her eyelashes are not reaching out and grabbing anything, but her eyes and her eyelashes are drawing in uh, this young man to that which is, is forbidden, that which is sensuous, that which is outwardly beautiful. All of these are characteristics of sexual temptation. But the reality of sexual immorality is not considered when someone is focused on the forbidden, the sensuous, and the outward only beauty uh, of someone. But there are true, real consequences. The reality of sexual immorality, and one of those is described here in Proverbs 5, verse 4. It says, In the end, she is bitter as wormwood. Um, what is being conveyed there is less to focus on, on wormwood, more to focus on in the end. Um, there is regret and remorse in adultery and sexual immorality. Uh, there is baggage that comes with that. 
Uh, why? Well, that's how God designed it. God designed uh, sexual activity to be within the bounds of marriage. Anything outside of that carries the guilt and the shame that accompanies sin. And so there is a real regret, a remorse uh, that follows sexual immorality. In the end, Solomon tells the young man, in the end, it's bitter. It's so bitter. You can taste the bitterness. But secondly, it is also as sharp as a two-edged sword. It is wounding. The world, the flesh, and the devil would tell us that uh, there are no consequences that accompany sexual immorality. Or those consequences that we would think accompany it are simply social mores. Uh, well, try explaining that to your conscience that God gave you. Uh, our conscience betrays the truth of the matter. And the truth is, is that sexual immorality cuts. It cuts deep. And anyone who has suffered the consequences of adultery, of unfaithfulness due to sexual immorality, uh, know that it spreads far beyond just the one who has engaged in sexual immorality. It is indeed wounding. And then third, look at verse 5, her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. Sheol is the Hebrew word uh, for grave or the place of the dead. And, and the idea here is destruction or death. There are consequences. In fact, the Proverbs uh, spends quite a bit of time talking about this. There are consequences to adultery and sexual immorality. Uh, again, uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil would like to convince us otherwise, uh, but that is just simply not the case. Uh, there is a destruction that comes with that, uh, even if it's just an internal demoralizing uh, but there's also an aspect of death. And when we think about death, we, we know by virtue of the language, whether it be uh, uh, lips or honey or dripping of oil, uh, all, all of this, we can, we can see that there's an imagery being, a poetic imagery being employed by Solomon. And so we, we, we can deduce that he's not talking about literal death. Although I suppose it could be uh, in the ins instance of um, retribution, if if, uh, if someone commits a adultery and the, and the spouse or, or uh, someone else uh, could uh, retaliate, I suppose. But more than likely, Solomon's not talking about literal physical death. Um, there is, of course, the possibility that he's referring to death as the con spiritual death and the consequences of sin. We might think about the consequences of the fall. Uh, think about uh, the example of the Garden of Eden and, and how uh, we died spiritually uh, through sin. Um, but more than likely, what Solomon is describing here uh, is certainly spiritual, but more akin to uh, the emotional a soul impact, the pain and suffering uh, that comes from adultery and sexual immorality. We could say, again, keeping with this metaphor, that, that it kills us. Uh, and to use that, that metaphor, uh, what do we mean? Well, we, we mean that it just, it just grips us to the heart. It takes us down. Um, it can sometimes affect people to the point where uh, they might say that it has ruined my life. It has ruined how I see life, and so forth and so on. And, and there, there is a real a, emotional, even spiritual sense of death that accompanies adultery and sexual immorality. And so I think that's what Solomon's talking about here. It's very real for anyone who's ever experienced it. Um, and it is indeed as if someone has killed them. Well... Uh, if all of this uh, sounds uh, quite depressing and, and sounds uh, heavy and, and deep and dark, and, and of course the encouragement would be that, that all of us who are in Christ, that we would not engage in sexual immorality, that we would not engage in adultery, that the Lord would graciously keep us from that, that we, as part of our sanctification, should be active in fighting against sexual temptation. Well, 
there's a lot in the Proverbs that deals with this. Uh, and so that's where I want to conclude today, is I want us to look at how do we fight sexual temptation. It's very practical. How do we fight sexual temptation? And I want to begin right there in verse 1 of chapter 5, if you happen to still have that chapter open in front of you. Proverbs chapter 5, look at the very first verse with me. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding, that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. Well, one of the first ways that we fight against, fight the good fight, against sexual temptation is to listen. Listen to godly counsel. Listen to godly counsel. Uh, when we are uh, put in a position uh, of temptation, uh, we should seek out the help of those who are wiser and stronger than we and draw from their experience, from their godliness, from their wisdom. Number two, look down at, chat, at verse 7 and 8. And now, O sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house. Keep your way far from her. When I was in business, I can remember somebody uh, referring to a man that I was doing business with at the time, and, and they said, you know, uh, he knows the line between legal and illegal. And what he likes to do is he likes to get right on that line and just walk right on the legal side, but it's oh so close to illegal. And I remember thinking to myself, I, I don't want to be that kind of businessman. I don't want to, to behave like that. I want to be way over on the, on the good side, not anywhere close to the line. Well, that's kind of the idea uh, that we have in these two verses is you, you stay far away from that temptation. Again, uh, the temptation here is embodied by, uh, for, for, the, for the young man, it's embodied by the adulteress, the, 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 the tempting forbidden woman. Uh, but again, uh, as, as we would take that figuratively, that would include uh, any form of sexual temptation. And so, keep away. Number one, listen. Number two, keep away. Don't go near to what might be tempting. Um, I can uh, remember giving counsel uh, to a young man and um, he was struggling with looking at inappropriate material on his smartphone. And, um, you know, the, these, these smartphones, you know, they could do, do everything in the world and all these uh, amazing things. And he just, he just really needed that smartphone, but it was the consistent stumbling block for him as well. And um, I said, uh, we'll, we'll go to Walmart and buy, and I don't remember how much they were, but let's just say 15 or $20, buy a 15 or $20 uh, uh, flip phone that has uh, no smart capacity whatsoever, but it can do, believe it or not, phones once upon a time were to call people and to receive calls from people, and you can text. It may take you 20 minutes to, ta to text okay, but, but you get that phone, and I said, and here's what it's gonna teach you. It's going to teach you to stay far away from the door of the adulteress. And, and, and he did. And, uh, and as far as I know, it was, it was helpful to him uh, to, to, to use that for, for a time, I suppose, to stay away from that temptation for him. So, number one, listen to godly counsel. Number two, keep away. Don't go near to what might be tempting. Number three, look at verse 9 and 10. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless, lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And then skip down to verse 20. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? And then if, if you uh, have your Bible open, you, you could even go over to chapter 6 
And in chapter 6 we read, The price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread. But a married woman hunts down but a, yeah, but a married woman hunts down a precious life. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes to his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. Well, in verses 9 and 10, in verse 20, and in chapter 6, verses 26 through 29, all of these verses are teaching us to do something that we typically don't do in the heat of the moment. And that is, we are to think. We are to think about what you're supporting, about what you are encouraging. Think about the matter. Consider it. I told someone uh, one time, again, referring to uh, pornography, um, do you even know where those dollars go? Do you even know what that is supporting? Do you know anything about uh, the compromise of the people that are involved in that or the industry or, or even the effect that it has even in those who are not in, uh, involved in pornography? Um, as those who have studied are, are now telling us that um, young men or young women who uh, engage in viewing pornography, they tend to see uh, those that they are attracted to in a different way. Again, going back to that objectification. They, they see that person as only someone who can fulfill their desires rather than someone uh, of value, a, a real person, a person of uh, integrity. And so we are to think about it. Think about it. What are you supporting? What are you encouraging? And not get trapped and caught up in the heat of the moment. Number four, look down at verse 11 and following. At the end of your life, you groan. When your flesh and body are consumed and you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. And that last verse there is referring to a person's public reputation. Uh, but of course, uh, all of that is just a description uh, of a life that, that didn't think about it, but just was consumed with their passions. Someone that didn't keep away from sexual temptation, but were constantly uh, drawn into it and allowed themselves to be. And someone who didn't listen to godly counsel, but just listened to their passions and their desires. Um, and all of this is described here in chapter 5 as the consequences. Uh, it's a miserable life. It's someone who comes to the end of their, their life and, and has lots of regrets and remorse and, and whether life's in shambles because, well, they didn't exercise self-control and self-discipline. And then if you skip down to verse 22, it says, The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him. Did you catch that? The sin of this person catches him like in a trap, and it snares him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. He keeps on keeping on in his sinful ways, even though he's ensnared in it, even though it is killing him. Well, the idea I'm trying to convey here, uh, or draw out of, rather, from the Proverbs, is similar to think, we are to consider. We are to consider the private guilt, and the potential public shame. There really are emotional consequences, even if there are not real uh, personal or public consequences that come from uh, sexual immorality and, and adultery. And so when we're tempted, uh, we not only need to think about what this is supporting and encouraging, but we also ought to consider what are the consequences of this. And by the way, I realize that you may be someone, maybe not you, but someone may be viewing today and say, 
no, I don't buy that. I, I, I don't think, for example, like the young man I gave the example, if I'm, I'm looking at something on, uh, on my smartphone um, and, and, and lusting after that person in the privacy of my own room, there are no consequences. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. There are consequences, and many of them that person is just simply blinded to. They don't see how it warps their mind. They don't see how it affects how they view the world and other people and so forth and so on, as I have I've said uh, before. And so there are always consequences. Number five, look at verse 15 and following. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, then let them be for yourself alone, and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed, and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Rejoice. Rejoice and enjoy. And you say, what? You mean that really is a way in which we can fight sexual temptation? Yes. Now, again, in, in, the, in this context uh, and the imagery that's being described here, I mean, you do realize he's not talking about springs of water and water coming out of the faucet, right? Uh, the, the idea here is the, the sexual uh, potency, if you will, or, or, or the description of that person's desire, sexual desire here, uh, is in their spouse. In this case, the young man's young wife or the wife of his youth. In, in fact, Solomon says something that all of those who would accuse Christians of being oh so prudish, well, they've never read this proverb before in which Solomon says, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated, be drunk always in her love. That's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. And so one of the ways that we fight sexual temptation, the temptation uh, to commit adultery or sexual immorality is to enjoy. Now, you may say, you may be watching and, and say, well, I'm, I'm not married and so uh, I, I am tempted and I'm not able to enjoy because I'm not married at this time and uh, one of the ways to think about this is that um, you are making deposits as you fight against that sexual temptation, you are making deposits into your own personal emotional bank account in terms of your faithfulness to your future spouse. The one who you will marry uh, one of these days, Lord willing, uh, you are remaining faithful uh, to that one who you may not even know at this time, but you're remaining faithful to them. Um, or. Uh, for the widow or, or widower, uh, sometimes it can be, it come in the form of a, a faithfulness uh, to a memory or a faithfulness to the way uh, that um, you know you should conduct yourself. But ultimately, ultimately, it's a faithfulness to the Lord. Ultimately, it's a faithfulness to the Lord. Uh, the Lord will protect you. The Lord will sustain you as you cry out to Him and ask Him uh, to help you in your moments of temptation. He will hear your cry. He will answer your prayer. And He will help you uh, through that as you call out to Him. And then finally, sixthly, uh, look at verse 21. For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. And so sixthly, to fight sexual temptation, we need to remember that we live quorum Deo. That is the Latin expression meaning before the face of God. Uh, we, all of our lives is before the face of God. Uh, you can't go into a, a closet deep and dark enough uh, to get away from the Lord. He sees everything. Everything is before Him. Uh, and so one of the ways that we fight sexual temptation is to, to remember that the Lord sees 
everything. And so our desire as Christians is to please Him, is to be faithful to Him, and to live righteously in Christ, Coram Deo. Well, that concludes our study for today. I hope that you found this uh, both uh, educational, enlightening, but also uh, edifying and encouraging, directing you how to fight sexual temptation. And uh, we will continue, uh, Lord willing, with our study of the Proverbs uh, next Sunday morning. Let's pray. Gracious God in heaven, uh, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you that as your spirit has led us and taught us, that so also you would strengthen and encourage us. May we be a people of uh, sexual and moral fidelity for your glory. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.